Good morning. This is Pastor Chuck Tyree from the Norwich Alliance Church. This is our sermon for January the 10th, 2021. Uh, before we look into Jeremiah chapter 2, please join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, we have much to come to you and thank you for, to praise you for. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us, guiding us into a life of freedom and joy in Christ. Uh, we so appreciate, Father, uh, your love and the love of Christ that unites us together. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, do in us what only you can do. We thank, Father, of families uh, in our church family and friends um, who are positive for co the COVID virus, for the Natick family and the Shoals and the Hastings family. We ask God that you would uh, touch and heal them, give them strength and your encouragement. We ask that uh, for those who are grieving these days, that you would be with them and be the lifter of their heads, Father. Encourage and strengthen them as they put their trust in you. And for our nation, Father, uh, more perhaps than ever, we pray for unity and love and respect for one another uh, in, in our nation and among your people in particular. Guide us today as we look into your word. Open our understanding. Open our heart to trust you and trust your word. We ask that you would speak to us as we listen uh, to you today. We pray in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. A book that was written years ago uh, by a medical doctor named Dr. Paul Brand is called The Gift of Pain. The premise of his book is that God has given uh, humans uh, the gift of pain, and that's not normally how you think of pain, is it? Uh, as he talked about the gift of pain, uh, Dr. Brand said that uh, you and I, when our hand starts to really hurt, uh, that is a gift from God, uh, that pain we're feeling, to tell us to get our hand away from the hot stove uh, before we're burned. If you've injured your ankle or your knee, uh, the gift of pain is what tells you to stop doing what you're doing that's injuring you or to stay off that ankle or stay off the knee until it heals. God has given us this, this gift uh, to protect us in a, in a dangerous world. Well, we're going to find out that sometimes the message of God to us especially through Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets, by the way, uh, is a problem uh, that he's solving through the gift of pain. Uh, one of the commentaries I read this week about this chapter of Jeremiah said that it's the job of the prophet to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. Well, that's the first five chapters of Jeremiah. Uh, he is afflicting the comfortable. The 21st century uh, church is culturally indistinguishable, we're told, from people who do polls and study uh, sociology. Culturally indistinguishable from the secular society around us. Our values, um, our habits, our social behaviors, uh, our relationships are statistically closer uh, to the unchurched culture around us than they are uh, to the church of the last uh, 50 years and especially to the church of the last century. So we uh, find that segments of evangelical Christianity have even defended these changes and said that they think they've made vast improvements on the church by being more like the secular society and less like the church of the past. What does God think? That's the only important question in all of this. And we're going to look into Jeremiah and allow God to speak to the Old Testament church, but also to us as we uh, apply the things that Jeremiah was told by the Lord to say to that church so that we can understand uh, how God sees us in the 21st century. If uh, we find ourselves afflicted in a little bit of emotional or spiritual pain uh, because of legitimately what God has to say to us, that's a good thing because it tells us to uh, repent, to change our behavior before we spiritually uh, harm ourselves or one another. 
So let's look into what uh, God said in, in Jeremiah's uh, second chapter. Here's the accusation from God. He uh, portrays this in the context of a courtroom. And God is the, the judge, and the aggrie but he's also the aggrieved husband. Uh, it, it might be family court that we're in, uh, where God is the husband and the church is the bride, his wife. And in verses 1 through 3, this is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest, all who devoured her were guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. God begins declaring his love for the church. You know, in the New Testament, the church, uh, Christians as a body worldwide, are considered the bride of Christ in the New Testament. So uh, this uh, metaphor for the church uh, is both an Old Testament and a New Testament application to the people who love and worship God. Well, like all romances, this began with a kind of honeymoon period. Uh, God loved Israel uh, like a bride. He protected her and provided for her. He delivered his people from slavery and bondage and death in Egypt. God protected them for 40 years in the wilderness. They didn't get sick. Uh, they were never hungry. They didn't have to look for food. Water gushed out of rocks in the middle of a huge desert. It was amazing how God cared for them, provided for them, and loved them. You know, during the great revivals uh, in the United States, in, in our history, uh, we could point to uh, churches that were full on weekdays, not just weekends. Uh, people who took their lunch hours and, and rushed together to pray and uh, support one another and talk about how to serve God and love people. It was amazing. What was your honeymoon period like when you first decided to follow Christ? Well, for many of us, uh, old sinful habits were abandoned and we had a deep passion to know God, to learn more about him. Uh, we read our Bibles. Uh, and it, it wasn't just on Sunday. Uh, we read them every day and sometimes for hours a day. We asked God uh, in prayer constantly to see him in our daily lives. And we saw God answering and guiding as, as we prayed and read the Bible. It, it was an amazing time for many of us. Well, Mercy Ministries also sprung up during these great revivals. Uh, we were telling our neighbors, our family and our friends uh, about Christ, but we were also showing them uh, Christ as we fed the hungry and started uh, many of the uh, soup kitchens, rescue missions uh, around the United States and the world. This was an amazing time. But, but sadly, um, that time came to an end gradually. Uh, and the same thing happened in Israel. Josiah, the young king, is reforming Israel. He's tearing down the altars to all the idols and false gods that the people had been worshiping. Uh, if you study the Canaanite religions, you'll discover their wealth, uh, ple physical pleasure, sensuality. Uh, the things they were actually worshiping were the same things uh, Americans worship. And so God, in seeing them abandon him and loving and worshiping and thinking about him and prioritizing uh, their love for God as a central part of their lives, uh, now substituted all these other things while uh, claiming to still be following God and, and true worshipers. So we, we find in verse 5, God asking them a question, what fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Uh, that's the accusation from God, the judge, in, in this first uh, chapter, uh, the first sermon, if you will, that Jeremiah begins to preach to the people uh, still in Israel. They had forgotten that God rescued them from slavery and death and into a land of plenty. They, they began to take all that for granted and wanted more. Our fallen culture imagines God to be a cosmic killjoy who wants to uh, stop us from having any kind of fun at all. 
The fact is that God leads us out of a life of slavery and emptiness and, and false pride and futility into a life of abundance and deep, meaningful love and real freedom. Instead of God being loved in holiness, they defied God and defiled their land. We uh, need to watch for that tendency because it happens again and again. God said, I brought you into a fertile land, in verse 7, to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. They did this by worshiping uh, created things, by prioritizing uh, pleasure and self-will and money, for example, uh, over God and other people. The investment of our time and energy and money will produce either emptiness or glory for you and me as well. At God's insistence, Jeremiah leveled these accusations against the regular worshiper, the average person uh, who went to the Old Testament version of a church. But he also leveled accusations at the feet of their pastors, the priests, who were so busy being popular, they quit seeking God themselves. They stopped leading people uh, away from the pagan culture around them. And instead, they joined the people in sensuality and sin. They led them nowhere. Uh, these false prophets were echoing the words of the culture's idols instead of the words of God. And I believe that's happening again today in, in our culture and in the church of the 21st century. The second issue is that the church began, instead of repenting and agreeing with God, they began to defend themselves, which is a natural tendency uh, for human beings. Now, this is the rest of the chapter. I'm not going to read uh, all, all of these uh, 23 verses, but uh, I'll start with verses 22 and 23. Uh, the people said they were clean. They, they said, I'm not defiled. Although you wash yourselves with soap and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the sovereign Lord. What were they saying, though? How can you say I'm not defiled? I've not run after the Baals these false gods that the Canaanites worshipped and sacrificed by the way uh, their infant children to. In, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, uh, God made a similar accusation uh, against a New Testament church. He said, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Uh, this is God calling the church back to repentance, but, but the church saying uh, what we're doing is right and what the church of the past did was actually uh, wrong and inferior to uh, the way we're doing things now. Well, uh, for example, we don't want to be narrow-minded. Uh, so, so the things that people in the past uh, following the word of God said were wrong or evil or sinful, uh, we're more open-minded about those things than they were. The people of the Old Testament church and people of the New Testament claim to be faithful to God. Well, read the letters to the seven churches in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. It's an accusation by Jesus himself against the New Testament church. Uh, for example, in Revelation 3.16, it says, Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich and I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This was the verdict of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the world, on the church uh, in the first century. Our tendency to justify ourselves and to declare ourselves uh, good uh, is a problem if God disagrees with us. For example, make a list of things God told you to change in your life uh, when you first became a Christian. And if you became a Christian at a very young age and you didn't have a long list of things uh, that you thought were, dis thought were displeasing to God, then uh, make a list of the things God told you to change uh, since you realized they were a problem in your Christian life. Now, from that list, uh, and please be thorough and completely honest, 
make another list of things that changed for a short time or only partially. But they didn't really change for very long. And then make a list of things that God has told you to change but didn't change at all. We can say we love God and we can say we worship Him. But as I look at uh, the social media pages of, of uh, believers, um, I discover that we're passionate about uh, many things, uh, but we seem, appear to be more passionate about many other things than we are about Christ. This is not an issue of legalism. This is not about right and just uh, right and wrong and making a, a list of uh, better behaviors and trying to feel like we're better than other people. Uh, God couches this in the language of love. He's saying, my, my people have committed two sins. Uh, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. God is saying, I love you so much. I want to provide for you and protect you and free you from the things that enslave you. But instead of loving me back and accepting uh, God's will and his word, uh, you've decided to go and, and dig these useless uh, cracked uh, containers for water that won't hold anything, and you're dying spiritually of thirst. Uh, you are lonely for God and, and think that he's left you when in fact you've left him. When our values are not God's values, and when we love things and other people more than we love God, we uh, indulge in things that enslave us. The oldest part and the oddest part of this is that they thought they were right, and they certainly were not right. Let's come to uh, this third point. The verdict from God, the judge. What does God think about all this? In verse 11, he said, has a nation ever changed its gods? And we can say that about the church. Has a church ever changed what it worships? Yet they're not gods at all. My people have exchanged the glory of God for worthless idols. And in verse 19, the judge gives a kind of ominous warning to those who do this. He said, your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. This is the, the verdict of God on this kind of apostasy. He is pointing to the fact that he's been a loving father. He sent Christ to die on the cross to forgive our sins and to send his Holy Spirit to give us a choice about the things we indulge in so that we're not so weak we just cave to temptations or uh, to the voices of the culture pressuring us uh, socially and otherwise to to follow uh, what they believe instead of following what God tells us is true. Jeremiah's heart was broken as he cried out to his people and appealed to them to return to the God who loved them. Choosing to betray the Lord who saved you takes grace for granted. He, he is saying that there are inevitable natural consequences when we abandon God and worship things and people and ourselves and our own opinions. Uh, he's saying your wickedness will punish you. God's not punishing people who are miserable and lonely and weak and struggling. Uh, our own choices are doing that for us. Uh, they say you can, you can, you're free to make your own choices, but you're not free to choose the consequences of your choices. Uh, God's allowing us, uh, when we choose to betray and abandon and deny him, uh, he's allowing us the freedom uh, that he blessed us with. But that also comes with its own set of consequences. We can't have uh, the richness we have in Christ uh, when we don't walk with Christ. Christians, for example, are dying from preventable things like addiction, suicide. We're, we're seeing families destroyed by uh, the same social evils that destroy the rest of the family in our culture. We could be living in peace and joy if we live in faith and faithfulness with Christ. If we love him and love people in his name. We don't have to be sucked into the conflicts of, of our culture and society. But sometimes we are 
uh, when we want people to agree with us in, instead of wanting them to agree with him. So what's the answer? What does Jeremiah tell them we and us that we need to do? Well, he, need, he called the church to personal accountability. In verses 31 and 32, he said, You of this generation, consider the word of the Lord. Have I been a desert to Israel or a land of great darkness? Why do my people say we are free to roam? Uh, we will come to you no more. Does a woman forget her jewelry, a bride her wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me. Uh, days without number. How many uh, days and nights do Christians spend in prayerlessness? Uh, how much of our passion do we waste on uh, things uh, that are not eternal, uh, but are temporary at best? We cannot avoid the judgment we bring on ourselves by our own choices. Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, if you read them, uh, say over and over that God gave people over to their own desires, what they wanted instead of him. But the, but the problem with that is, is the way of sin is also the way of bondage and death. Uh, you say I'm innocent. He is not angry with me, but I will pass judgment on you because you say I have not sinned. It says in verse 35. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, it says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and also, by the way, from the effects of trying to do life without God. God is going to bless you if you worship and love him, if you're devoted and passionate about him. Uh, when you're not, we need to honestly repent. Please examine your life, and I'm going to examine mine. Is Jesus Christ my first love? Is he the authority for my values? Is he my savior and, and not uh, something or someone else? Well, life as followers of God was not going as they hoped for Jeremiah's people. And it's not going that way for many people who profess to be Christians today. They found themselves defeated, weak, easily enslaved, discouraged, uh, instead of overjoyed and, and enjoying God's abundance. Their own sinful habits had control of their lives rather than the Holy Spirit having control of them. The gods of pleasure and popularity weren't helping them at all, no matter how they sacrificed and invested for them. And not only that, but they were comfortable in their false uh, religion. So, so if God has sent the Holy Spirit today to afflict the comfortable, uh, you and me, and, and we can go back to uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Brand's book, The Gift of Pain. Uh, if that hurts, if it stings a little, uh, that's okay. God's trying to heal us and turn us around while there's time. The invitation he is here to turn to the true God, to love him as he loves us, and to discover that Christ is going to give us a life that's abundant and free. Uh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us in Christ uh, such an amazing, amazing life, a life that's abundant and free. We ask you, Lord, that uh, if we're on trial and if any of these accusations in our heart applied to us, that we would respond understanding it's not your desire to condemn us, but to free us and to give us a rich and abundant life. Now, like the one you gave uh, your people as you delivered them in, in the wilderness. We ask, Father, that today people might turn to you uh, wherever we've turned to other things and love you and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as, uh, as we invite you today, uh, 
come to Norwich Alliance Church when you're ready. Uh, the vaccine's out there and more and more people are being vaccinated. Um, and I've had two or three people this week say, as soon as I get that vaccine, I'm going to come back to church. Well, good for you. And I hope that happens uh, for you soon if that's in your plans. Uh, if you need anything, call the church number. Uh, there's our email address. You can be on our prayer list and know what's going on. God bless you. And we hope to see you soon.